Section two of Tales of the Uneasy by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. The Telegram, Part two. At a quarter to eight on Saturday evening, she was all ready, dressed in black and looking very handsome on one side of the brightly burning fire, for there was a slight touch of frost in the air. Her senses were alert. She found herself actually listening for the sound of his hansom driving up to the door. Quite lover-like, she thought, with a little laugh, to herself. She remembered the last sentence in Everard's old maidish letter, which she passed over on first reading. He had informed her that this was his birthday. She welcomed this as a touch of sentiment. The sentiment she had not in the old days been solicitous to cultivate in him, but had carelessly let die. She wished she could remember exactly how old he was to-day. If she had been able to allude to it, it would have pleased him. No use. She could not recapture the knowledge. She supposed he might be somewhere about forty. And he was late. How dared he be late for her? Was there a fog, perhaps? She went to the window, parted the heavy curtains, and looked out. Rather misty, but not enough to prevent Everard from keeping time. If he had started early enough to dress, how rude if he hadn't! She remained drumming on the pane with her long, slender fingers, looking down into the empty roadway. She had not heard the door of the drawing-room open, but suddenly, before she had time to turn away from the window, Everard stood beside her with his handkerchief held up to his face, a familiar gesture of his for which she had often reproved him. "'How are you?' she asked him, rather frigidly. "'What a draught you seem to have brought in with you!' "'May I shut the door?' Everard said, suiting his action to the words. "'Come to the fire, won't you? You are cold.' She spoke more cordially, but in spite of her definite intentions to propose herself to Everard that evening, the curious sense of physical alienation, which she knew now had held them apart all these years, returned to her with tenfold vigour. Her instinct had been right. Physical leanings counted for something, and there was no real affinity between them. Alice shivered a little, for she was a sensible, business-like woman, and she firmly meant to override the absurd and awkward shrinking, and marry him. Her mind once made up, she never went back. He was holding his thin, blue-veined hands to the blaze. His eyes seemed to avoid hers. "'Yes, that's right,' she said. "'I hope you have got a good appetite. I have ordered such a nice little dinner for you.' "'How kind of you! But really, I eat very little except fish.' My doctor has cut me down remorselessly. And do you attend to him? You never used. I have to attend to his orders. I am in rather a bad way, Alice. The base of one lung is quite solid, and the other is gone. Nonsense! I believe you're as right as I am, barring this little bit of a cold, that you'll soon get rid of. You haven't coughed once since you were in the room, do you know? I fancy that living alone, as you do, you go and get ideas about yourself, and then rush out and call in a doctor who frightens you. Maybe, he said slowly, loneliness certainly doesn't improve one's perspective, and I haven't been inside anyone else's house for a month. There, now, what did I say? And what do you do when you are at home? Sit over the fire and grizzle and think of your sins, and mine, eh? Not yours, much, said he with a chilling effect of partial forgiveness which benumbed Alice, whose fighting spirit was up in arms to bring him to her feet again. The maid announced dinner, and Alice took his recalcitrant arm, which gave her the sense of being glued to his side. On the way downstairs she thought, Poor dear, he will want civilizing all over again. You'll drink champagne, she suggested, when they were both seated. No water, please he added, speaking to the maid. Thanks, no soup. He allowed a helping of fish to be placed on his plate, but he did not eat a mouthful that Alice could see. The dreary dinner progressed. Alice Damer ate for two, and every now and then looked furtively at the man she had made. It was her fault. She saw it now. This man had been her slave. She had been his inhuman master. She had laid him on the rack, 
she had starved his heart for bread she had given him a stone this was what their famous understanding had amounted to the ruin of a man a pale thin hectic mask sitting opposite her pretending to eat the play of his thin wrists that manipulated his knife and fork drove her frantic his sullen eyes refusing to meet hers as in tones that only faintly represented the rich soft legal measured voice she used to know he responded gently but dully to all her conventional openings and allowed the subjects she started so painstakingly to drop one by one what would the servants think little pearly drops of dismay and effort broke out on her own white forehead the effort she was making was too much for even her social fortitude yes she knew she had behaved badly to him but he might let her down more easily vexing of him for what she had to do must be done in spite of difficulties the last course had been removed two punctilious slightly shocked maids had disappeared and the couple were left alone over the walnuts and the wine she spoke to him quite crossly in a voice she could hardly command aren't you interested in anything everard yes dear in some things for instance in your calling me by my christian name for the first time he replied quietly alice felt uncomfortable such a direct thrust from this petrifaction suggested that he had seen through her who hardly realized herself and what she was doing oughtn't i i forgot oh don't apologize it doesn't matter i wanted you to badly once do you remember strange when it does come one is more or less past caring coffee i make it myself now as you see yes please she made it she handed it she even let her fingers graze his as she passed him the cup it was literally the first time she had ever practised her own special art of flirtation in everard's connection then there fell a silence between them the patent coffee-machine ceased to bubble its duties were sped alice sipping a restorative draught of the tonic liquid broke the silence bravely she felt that she owed it to him to take the initiative i am feeling very lonely now she said softly poor child you must be he answered gravely and i think i i understand a little better how you must have felt all these years he lifted his fishy eyes for the first time to hers yes but i am used to it now but everard it hasn't done you any good no i dare say not everard do you think now do you believe we you and i i mean would have got on together how do you mean in what relation i mean in the usual relation if i had wanted what you wanted well you know i thought so then not now no not now did i not tell you that i had grown philosophical whatever is is good oh dear then you tell me that you think it is good you're living alone with not a soul to talk to or exchange an idea with no one to look after you when you are ill as you are now but just to sit mooning over a dying fire the ghost of a shrug was vouchsafed her oh i keep my fire up and i mix my own grog and drink it and warm my own slippers it isn't so bad everard she rose to her feet and he imitated her supposing that a move to the drawing-room was contemplated no i am not going up yet not till we have had this out you do make it very difficult for me it is as if you had lost the key you will not understand a demimo why should it be a demimo he repeated after her catching however none of her fire he sat down again and motioned her to do the same then he spoke dully but very clearly let us talk quietly and not get excited over it a man in my condition has no time for vagueness i do understand quite well and i will show you that i do you are willing to marry me now yes she cried breathlessly yes poor everard and you you don't want me to any more 
I want nothing. I don't think of me. Let us consider only you. Now tell me, would this marriage be of any use to you? Use to me to be married to you, Everard? She started. Sorry, but I can only put it from the point of view of utility. My personal desires are dead. Ah, I killed them. Yes, my dear, you killed them. I can't pretend to any extravagant feelings of joy at what I suppose we must call your capitulation. You know, they give better terms to beleaguered fortresses the sooner they surrender. You, Alice, in your pride and impregnability, left it too long. The wine got musty in the bottle, and the cord got frayed and rotten. I am no good to you or anybody. My life is done. I thought all this out as I lay there wrote some of it down even i never thought i should get a chance of telling it all to you in person i could not rest in my delirium delirium oh everard what nonsense he put her exclamations aside well i have told it you now and i shall rest in peace if it's any consolation to you you have had a good scold a good go at me alice cried angrily adding with bitterness and plus the satisfaction of refusing me but not at all he said turning surprised lacklustre eyes on her if you think a marriage with me would do you any earthly good you shall have it i ought to have made that clear i wanted to do good to you she wailed too late for that i won't pretend even to salve your conscience alice that i care anything at all about it besides your conscience has no need of salving you were perfectly right not to marry me in your heyday and mine if you could not love me you are very kind and perfectly in order to suggest it now as a way of making me useful to you as you have done in the past i am at your service now as ever i am reserved to your use as good as married to you already though not you to me and quite ready to go to church with you to-morrow if you decide that we shall do so i am your property only my dear it is a pity you tied me up in brown paper and left me on the shelf so long fatal delay unused i deteriorated you have had me warehoused so many years that now when you choose to untie me and take me down you find that you will have to make allowance for depreciation of stock i think i wrote that to you or said it how it did amuse mrs clarkson who's mrs clarkson she asked through her tears he did not answer but rose and took her in his arms pale flickers of posthumous triumph lighted up his kind lined face weakly victorious he enfolded her and she shrunk and shivered out of his embrace what is it dear nothing oh nothing only i don't believe i can marry you everard after all he did not ask her why and she could hardly have told him that the momentary contact had affirmed the sense of physical aversion she had always thought she felt for him now she was sure oh what was she to do she stood timorously away from him as it were freed from the clasp of a corpse how could she tell him that and then she reflected consolingly that according to his own words marriage meant so little to him now that she need perhaps never kiss him when they were married her colour returned a little as she formulated this evasion many a conscientious woman has forced herself before now to marry a wreck to pay conscience money there was a good fire burning she motioned him to one of two leather-covered chairs drawn up on opposite sides of the fireplace it's warm here we won't go upstairs i'm really getting rather frightened about you everard i was incredulous at first but i do believe now that you have been ill yes i have been very ill but why come out why didn't you send an excuse ask me to come to you would you have come well as a matter of fact a telegram was sent you mrs clarkson said she had sent it mrs clarkson your landlady your bedmaker oh dear how unkind you must have thought me no i don't know that i thought anything about it 
i said she might send it and then it passed out of my mind entirely everything did go clean out all at once somehow it's a most unusual sensation very like death i should think everard i believe you ought to be in bed now you ought not to be here pleasant as it is go home and i'll come and nurse you to-morrow i can safely do that i am engaged to you she spoke with mouth awry putting the greatest constraint upon herself he smiled awfully kind of you dear but i've got a nurse already mrs clarkson is a nurse everard you're dreaming do you mean a white-capped creature with starched cuffs how could you be here if that were so i don't know but i am here you see mrs clarkson certainly did send you a wire to say i couldn't come she asked you to come to me i believe though i forbade her as i told you he sighed i forgot it all but then why have you come and why haven't i got the wire wrongly addressed i fancy i was too ill to speak much she looked the address up in my book and i have only your old one there it shows how i've neglected you but it's as well you didn't come the nurse is excellent these hired people do best because they have no feelings whether it's merely putting on a poultice or finally laying you out oh don't everard he rose he looked preoccupied it's after midnight do you realize how late we have been talking right into the night the daylight will surprise us in a minute oh dear me i must be off he rose and stood wavering like a wind-blown taper good-night dear alice i shan't forget you have kissed me once in your life oh no twice once on the river that day the twelfth of july i loved you i wish you had loved me too i did i do she averred her lips chattering too late said he taking a woollen comforter out of his pocket everard i don't think you are fit to go home alone let me send someone with you or or stay here the servants are not gone to bed and there's a spare room slept in only last night aunt polly and your reputation i'll risk that she said i've behaved too badly to you not to make you some amends but it's all nonsense i am all right strength has been given me how funnily you talk well since you will be foolhardy and go back to your nurse is she pretty you know i don't believe in her you are thinking of your landlady who's been mothering you a little as she should she put out her hand and rang the bell a hansom please for mr jenkins you shouldn't have done that he said i meant to walk well you aren't going to be allowed to walk you must take no risk have a good night's rest and be well enough to marry me to-morrow by special license she looked up in his face with terror-stricken audacity how could she do it would you really he was out in the hall by now and the maid was whistling for a cab well we'll see i'll come to you at eleven in paper buildings i know the way i've been there once dear alice how unmaidenly you are grown all of a sudden i like it though it is some compensation but will you really marry me if i come if i can he answered gravely the hansom had come rattling up she gave a twist to the comforter keep it well over your mouth i will kiss your hand first she controlled herself his touch was pain to her she wailed as the hall door closed oh i don't love him he is dead i have killed him i'll marry him that is my vow the strayed telegram was brought her next morning on the tray with her tea it had been as everard had surmised wrongly addressed to the old house it ran mr jenkins unable to go to you to-night ill come if prefer she must have been in a rare fright when she wrote that whoever she is thought alice who could not bring herself to believe in the presence of a nurse in eighty-two paper buildings her exultation of last night had left her 
Everard was such a wreck, poor dear. Every bit of charm, and he never had much, had departed and left him sere, dry, stupid, and unsympathetic. But she meant to marry him and repair her sins and be able to live without a companion. Even an invalid husband was better than a hired salacium. She would go and see him this morning, but of course they could not really be married at once, out of hand, like that. In a week or so, after a few preparations had been made, and when he had been nursed up and made to look a little less ghastly, she could not allow a ghost to lead her to the altar. Then they would go off somewhere warm for the honeymoon, to the Riviera or Egypt, and Everard would revive under the combined influences of sun and agreeable society and love that is, if he was still capable of feeling the kindly glow of a delayed, but at last gratified passion. Perhaps he was not quite so dead after all. Perhaps in time she would find herself able to submit to his kisses without a politely suppressed shudder, though she could easily account for that symptom of hers, starved physically and mentally as he seemed to be. What wonder that all the magnetism had gone from him? Alice, none other, would nurse him back to life, make a charming, attentive, affectionate husband of him, one whose kisses she would get not to mind so much. She drove down to the temple and dismissed her carriage at the gate on the embankment and walked up. Quite unnecessarily, for Everard's rooms in paper buildings had a road in front where a carriage might stand. But she did not mind walking. It was a lovely morning. The famous fountain in the court was playing merrily, and suggested springing hopes of all sorts, and possibilities of revival. She walked along to Everard's rooms with a light step, laughing a little to herself at the thought that she was going to earn for him the reputation of being a dog. She did not suppose many young ladies sought out the dry student lawyer in his rooms. His landlady, or laundress, whichever it was, would be shocked and a good thing, too. His character was altogether too immaculate, and a picturesque smudge or so would improve it in the eyes of men. Alice had all the sweet, headlong depravity of mind of the excessively innocent. Using her tortoise-shell pince-nez, she read the name of Everard Jenkins printed on the wall on the right-hand side of the open door of number 82, and, plunging into the dimness, began to ascend. She met a man on the first landing who looked like a doctor. He seemed in a hurry to get to his hansom, which she had observed standing there. He merely peered in her face and passed on before she could ask him if he was the doctor, and if so, how Mr. Jenkins was. She went on ascending till she found the right door, knocked, and stood there breathless. A foolish fear assailed her as she waited. She found herself dreading the first sight of Everard as he would appear on opening the door to her. She remembered with annoyance the poor, lank, gawky face, which always made her think, as she used to tell her mother, of a boy's compendious clasp-knife, with all the blades open. He would smile, of course, and look pleased to see her. It was a strong step for haughty Alice Damer, whom he had sighed for so long, to visit a man in his rooms at half-past eleven, and ask him to marry her. He was a long time coming. She rang again more firmly. The door was opened by a nurse. Everard had not been raving then. He was probably in bed, and she formally muttered his name. The nurse seemed to have been expecting her, murmuring, "'You would like to see him, ma'am?' She led the way into the sitting-room, out of which the bedroom obviously opened. The door was ajar. The nurse did not stop. "'But not in there!' Alice stammered. A strong note of disapprobation pierced in the woman's voice as she turned round sharply. "'Why not? He's dead. You're not going to faint?' "'Oh, no,' said the poor girl, striving to adjust herself to these new and unexpected circumstances. Like a proud, plucky automaton, she entered the bedroom, and looked on the form that was faintly outlined under the sheet, so thin Everard had grown. She had good nerves, and could always bear shocks well, but an immense searching pity, a world of value for the dead man, combined with self-depreciation, filled her, and she wept silently. 
her noble calmness and self-restraint won the admiration of the nurse who had been condemning the heartless creature wholesale for having left her sweetheart to die alone as she had done what was it nurse she asked double pneumonia collapse i telegraphed to you miss you are miss damer i believe he objected but once he became unable to speak i took it upon myself i thought you would want to be here of course but i have only just got it the nurse accepted the amende she could not realize that alice was struggling to form a comment on the apparent inconsistency of a man sick unto death being able to dine with her hoping at the same time that dates would be proved not to fit and all be normally explained she stammered something vague as the nurse laid down the covering sheet and disclosed the still face looking however no more emaciated than alice had seen it in life and no longer ago than last night alice was painfully aware of the tacit suggestion on the woman's part that she should bend down and kiss that waxen mask and recoiled though the nurse had said no word oh i can't kiss anybody dead it's awful of me nurse but i can't some can't said the nurse resignedly and this girl was the poor gentleman's fiancée so she had understood she was a little pacified when alice unfastened the bunch of lilies of the valley that she was wearing and laid them on the dead man's breast then she turned away and dried her eyes she was a beautiful creature the nurse thought and was conscious that the faulty young lady was slowly acquiring her sympathies when did he die when was it we don't know exactly miss in these cases but he last spoke about seven what made you think of sending to me because miss for days before when he was wandering worst he talked about you we gathered the doctor and i that he was more or less engaged to you miss but that you was rather too fond of putting him off said it had been going on for years and that he was fairly worn out so he was poor man he hadn't an ounce of flesh on his bones to spare yes but the girl exclaimed impatiently i want to get at the facts he died you say this morning at seven o'clock spoke last at seven o'clock last night miss i said died some time in the night or may be directly after he did speak at least part of him may have died as ignorant people seem to think he was hardly breathing at a little before eight but the last spark may have been held on longer i suppose you know nurse that he dined with me last night at a quarter past eight said the girl stonily looking away from the nurse's apathetic face which changed at once sympathetically miss you're upset you took it so calm at first have some brandy you have had a shock one understands he dined with me alice repeated obstinately the nurse stared at her and shrugged her shoulders poor girl she was evidently one of the outwardly quiet ones who smother the symptoms of disturbance only to feel the shock more keenly people take these things in such a variety of ways the idea of the dinner party had got fixed in her mind by the shock she was unable now to let go of the idea of everard's keeping his engagement with her she had received the telegram all right of course there could be no doubt of it and some domestic reason had prevented her from responding to the summons or possibly that same backwardness which had affected the smooth course of the engagement had been at work she hadn't cared for him much though she had been persuaded into giving her word in an even tone calculated to restore the shattered nerves of the shaken girl the nurse remarked mr jenkins sister-in-law the one that lives in france will be here presently to see about the funeral arrangements he wanted you to have all his old china and books miss he used to say so and doubtless that will be done but alice damer had gone resolutely across to the bed from which the two in the course of conversation had unconsciously deviated she dexterously turned down the sheet and stooping performed the rite of love the little act of devotion which she had refused him just before 
What was she saying? Mrs. Clarkson observed closely what she considered one of the curiosities of mental stress. I kissed him last night when he came to me. So you see, whether I liked it or not, I did kiss a dead man. And it's no use minding now, is it? She kissed him repeatedly, with a pale semblance of passion. The nurse took her arm gently, and led her away from the bed, and she submitted to be placed in a chair. "'Miss, now you've done that, you'll feel better. I should go home if I were you. Take that hansom outside. It's the one you came in, perhaps, and you haven't paid him?' Alice signified a negative to this, helplessly, but allowed the nurse to pin her veil on for her. It hid her tear-stained face a little. Then the good woman led her downstairs and out on to the pavement. Sure enough, there was a hansom waiting there, and the nurse hailed the driver. Gruffly, he turned round and stared at them. "'And I say,' he appeared to be remarking, "'and I say, who's going to pay me my fare?' "'Why, the lady will, of course. Get in, miss. I'll hold your dress away from the wheel.' But the cabman was not satisfied, nor did he address himself to the task of resuming his drooping reins. He seemed to have had a shock, too. "'No, I didn't mean her. Who's going to pay me three bob for last night, and for wait near? "'That's no affair of ours,' replied the nurse cheerfully. "'You must take the lady. Where to, shall I say, miss?' Alice, crouching inside, mumbled the address of her home. The cabman swore. "'No, I'm damned. You get out. I ain't a-going near that blasted house again for nobody. Took a fare from there last night, I did, and drove him here. "'And here I may stop till doomsday, I suppose, "'before I see a shillin' of his money. "'Tain't right.' "'He was obviously drunk, but not dangerous, so the nurse thought. "'Come, come,' she expostulated. "'Alice, frightened, prepared to get out. "'Oh, what's the matter?' she moaned. "'Matter! Matter's this. "'I drove him here right enough and pulls up where he told me, "'and my gentleman doesn't get out.' "'Seems as if he was a-goin' to make a night of it in my cab. "'Drunk,' I says to myself, and I opens the trap, "'meanin' to take my fare and clear him out. "'But, Lord bless me, why, there wasn't no one there.' "'He'd got out, of course,' said Mrs. Clarkson, "'while you weren't looking. "'Bilked,' says I, "'and, thinks I, I'll just come and wait here "'till I sees my gentleman come down those stairs again.' "'You'll never see him come downstairs again,' said the nurse, with a flash of inspiration. "'Except in his coffin. Come, get on. Take the lady where she wants to go.' She thought of it all, afterwards, but then nurses see such queer things. She had taken the cabman's number. End of section 2